John, and thank you for the lovely time we've spent together so far. And uh, even that ride from the, you know, airport, uh, like I didn't know I could fit into such a small space, but uh, I did. All things are possible with God, and so <laughs> thank you, John. <laughs> Oh, lovely. Let's turn to the word of the Lord and uh, together shall we turn to the reading that was uh, brought before us. I want to begin by asking you a question. And the question is, are the things that you are living for worth Christ's dying for? Are the dreams and the passions and the pursuits that you're engaged in right now worth Christ's dying for? What an incredible question to ask. Who can ever know whether the things they're living for are worth Christ dying for? In fact, why did Christ die? Well, Paul answers that question for us in verse 14 of the passage that was read to us. Because Christ's love compels us, and we are convinced that one died and therefore all died. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them. Now we may ask a question, not live for myself? We hardly know anyone who doesn't live for themselves. And in fact, this this living for oneself has become a basic, normal, featured feature in this self-centered world. Looking out for number one. Pursuing our individual goals and dreams at whatever the cost. Climbing the career ladder. Finding personal happiness, whatever it takes. We live for ourselves. We're driven by greed. And we even use our faith to advance our and this self-centeredness has become a basic, normal feature of even the Christian life. When I share Christ with somebody, I want to tell them what God can do for them. When I go into a bookstore to buy a book, I want to buy a book that tells me how God will bless my finances and bless my career and bless my marriage and help me pursue my goals and fulfill my dreams. And God can do all these things because he intensely wants to bless you and I. But I have news for you, my brothers and sisters. The purpose of your life does not revolve around yourself. Sometimes we act as though Christ belongs to us. As though I am the center of the universe and everything including God revolves around me and my desires. Well, my brothers and sisters, let me tell you this. God doesn't want to be involved in your plans for your life. He wants you to be involved in his plans for your life. Christ died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them. In John chapter 12, verse 24, Jesus turned to his disciples and he told them this, Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now can you imagine with me if a farmer is out harvesting or rather casting seeds so that he can sow his field and as he is about to cast that seed out one of them cries out and says leave me alone leave me alone I don't want to be cast out leave me alone I don't want to be put to the ground it would never ever bear fruit and this lesson comes home again and again to us in the scriptures, because in the very same verse, next verse, Jesus goes on to tell his disciples, the man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be, and my father will honor the one who serves me. God says, it is the one who lays down his life, the one who takes up his cross, to whom he will disclose himself to. 
only in dying to self can we live. When the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through to verse 9, Whatever was to my profit, I consider loss for the sake of knowing Christ Jesus. And what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Indeed, I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Paul knew what he was talking about. Because he had been that seed that had been put to the ground, that had been broken open and had shooted and now could give out a fragrant aroma to the glory of God. You know, somebody once said, no great advances have been made for Christianity by men and women who were unwilling to give up their lives. Let me say that again. No great advances have been made for the cause of Christ, have been made for the kingdom of God, have been made for the extension of the gospel by men and women who were unwilling to give up their lives, unwilling to give up my life. We can hardly give up a TV show that we know is not even honoring to the Lord. Give up my life? Why is it this way? I believe it is because we have never settled in our hearts that I do not live for myself anymore. For Christ's love compels me that those who live should no longer live for themselves, that those who live should no longer live for their careers, that those who live should no longer live for their dreams. That those who live should no longer live for their comforts or their security or their advancement. But that they should live for him who died for them. One of the reasons we can't live for him today is because we want to live safe and comfortable lives. But if the greatest desire in my life is to live safe and comfortable, then I will not risk my life. I will not risk my comforts. I will not risk my wealth. I will not risk my retirement. I will not risk my treasures for the things that move the heart of God. It's also been said, it is possible to evade a multitude of sorrows by cultivating an insignificant life. Listen to what Gary Hagan of the International Justice Mission says. Here is a choice that our Father wants us to understand as Christians. And I believe that this is a choice of this generation, of this age. Do you want to be brave or safe? Because you cannot be both. Doing God's will in a fallen world is inherently dangerous, he says. In fact, if following Jesus doesn't feel dangerous right now, you should probably pause and check to see if it's really Jesus you're following. Let me put that in simple layman language. If you haven't met the devil recently, you're probably walking in the same direction. Can you imagine if Jesus had gone to the Father in heaven and said, Father, you've called me to go to earth and to redeem mankind, and I am willing to do that. But can I ask you one question before I go? And the Father would have said, yes, my son, ask me. And Jesus goes on to say, Father, I just, I, I, I just wanted to know, is it safe? <laughs> and the Father would have had to say, no, my son, it is not safe. Immediately you are born, men will come hunting for you. And as a result, innocent babies will be killed. And you will have to go into hiding as a refugee to Africa. And when you come back to Palestine, there will be a whole institution that has been established to try and remove you. And they will try to stone you, and they will try to throw you over a cliff, and they will shame you and ridicule you, and eventually they will catch you and whip you and spit at you and crucify you. And you will die 
one of the most excruciatingly painful deaths known to mankind. No, my son, it is not safe for you to go, but will you go? Jesus did not play it safe. He lived brave. The disciples, the early disciples, did not play it safe. They were persecuted, they were flogged, they were imprisoned, they were exiled. In all their suffering, one of the beautiful things you see is they never ever go to the Father in heaven and say, Lord, it's too much, it's too much, we can't bear this, please remove the persecution. Never. Indeed, their words are caught for us in Acts chapter 4 and verse 29. And their prayer was, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your words with greater boldness. If they persecute us at this level, give us greater boldness so that we continue to proclaim your words. If they raise a the level of persecution, raise a level of boldness that we have, Lord, but we will not go back and we will not remain silent. They did not play it safe. They lived brave. The Apostle Paul wrote his own testimony in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 27. And he said of his life, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews of 40 lashes minus one. I have constantly been on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Paul did not play it safe. He lived brave. Where living brave means that I will obey the Lord no matter what the consequences. Where living brave means that I will take a step of faith out of my comfort zone. Where living brave means trusting God for the unknown. Where living brave means not demanding that we first know how God is going to act and how this story will end before we're willing to obey. Where brave means that God doesn't have to explain himself to me. When he decides to lead my life in a certain direction, whatever he calls me to do, he doesn't need to explain himself to me. I have given my life over to him. It is his to do what he wants. Where brave means that God doesn't have to ask my permission before he brings trial and tribulation my way. You see, my dear friends, if God has to ask for your permission before he does something that costs you, then he is not God. You are. Because he has to ask for your permission. I don't want to serve a teeny weeny little God who comes and says, Oh, Oscar, pretty please, can I please, please just touch your life with a little bit of suffering just for two days, please? I don't want to live for a God like that. He is not worthy of worship. I want to live for the God that the psalmist speaks of in Psalm 115 and verse 3 where he says, Our God is in heaven and he does whatever pleases him. He doesn't ask for permission. But if my greatest desire in life is to live safe, then I will never know the greater purposes of God. Many of us like to quote Philippians chapter 2 and verse 2. 22, where it says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And this life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Well, my dear friends, let me tell you something about those who have been crucified and who have died. You can go to the local hospital, the local mortuary, the morgue, and pull out one of those trays where they put dead bodies on, and you can whip out a revolver, a gun, and hold it to the head of the person that lies on that tray, and tell them, you know, I can shoot you right now, right here, I can pull this trigger on you. Doesn't flinch. Why? Because he's dead. And you can pull out a metal rod and beat them and beat them and beat them black and blue. They do not 
cry out because they have died. May I suggest to you that one of the problems we have in the church today is that many of us did not actually die in Christ. We only fainted. <laughs> and so when we see trouble and suffering coming our way, we come awake and we run because we never really died to self. One of my heroes of faith is a man that those of you who are older here can remember his name being mentioned. We don't hear too much of him nowadays, but you would recognize who he is if you have had a number of years of life. And this is George Mueller, the man who run these amazing orphanages in Bristol in the UK. George was born in 1805, and by his own admission, he was a scoundrel and a rascal. When his mother passed away, he was 14 years old. But he was not by her bedside as she drew in her last breath. He was out on the streets with his friends getting drunk. His father was so frustrated with him that he took this young man and he soaped him and whooped him and then sent him off to the rural areas to reform his life. But nothing would change George. And so finally, send him to university, and to have him train as a minister of the gospel in the hope that somewhere in the church you'd get a salary and make something of himself. Well, George went to university, and the very first night that he went, the very first day that he went to the university, a friend of his came along and said, George, a, a number of us gathered together to read the Bible. Would you join us tonight as we read the scriptures? And to his surprise, to the surprise of the friend, George said, yes, I'll come. And he did. It was on that night that he came to know Christ as his Lord and Savior. And one of the things that struck George as he was growing up as a young Christian at the university is that he despaired to see so many Christians who were troubled and filled with tremendous anxiety because they didn't fully trust in Christ and they didn't really believe that God could take care of them. This deeply impacted George. And he determined to do something about it. And so he wrote in his own words, and I quote, he said, And so I, a poor man with no money, have decided by prayer and faith alone to start an orphanage to provide shelter for the little children who live on the streets of Bristol. I will care for these children and clothe and feed them and house them, even without ever asking anyone for a single penny. God will have to show that he can provide and take care of them. And it is my hope, he went on to say, that I will in this way strengthen the faith of God's children and also provide a testimony to those who do not know God to show them that he is faithful to care for his own. Here are the accomplishments of George's life. In 1836, as a young man of only 30 years, he took in 30 orphaned girls. Now what you need to realize, these were the days of pre-industrial England, when the cities were run on coal, and cities were black with the soot, the soot that came from the furnaces of the factories that manufactured things. And there were many orphaned children on the streets of Bristol and Leeds and Manchester and London, and they were hungry. They had nowhere to sleep. They would run around running amok on the streets and they were called street urchins. They were a pest. They would run into the markets and grab for food because they had no food. And they were a bother to everybody. George determined to care for them. And he began by taking 30 little girls, orphaned girls, and giving them shelter in his home. But 30 was not equal to the measure of his heart. He wanted to have so many more children. And so he began to pray that God would give him the money to be able to build orphan houses. And God provided for him and he built five large orphanages that could house 2,000 children at one go altogether. Over his life, he cared for 10,024 orphans. And he never once asked anyone for a single penny or a single shilling. 
His example changed England. At the time that he started this work, there were only an estimated 3,600 beds in the whole of England for these little children. By the time that he moved on from this work 50 years later, so many people had been inspired by George's example that even the state itself began to open up orphan houses and the numbers went from 3,600 beds to about 100,000 beds by the end of George's life. Throughout his life, it is estimated that he prayed in more than 100 million US dollars, maybe the equivalent of 120, 130 million Australian dollars, never once asking anyone for a single shilling. He established 117 schools and educated 120,000 children through those schools. When he turned 70, he decided to leave this work of the orphans behind and do something that he had always longed to do but never had the opportunity. He went out as a missionary at the age of 70 to preach the gospel around the world. He visited a total of 42 countries, spoke to an estimated 3 million people over those 17 years before he passed away at the age of 87 years. Stories are told of how the children would gather together in the breakfast room in the morning in these orphan houses. And there was no food in the pantry, there was no food in the kitchen, there was nothing to provide for them. But George would come and tell the children, children, let's bow our heads and close our eyes and thank God, not ask God, but thank God for the breakfast that he is about to provide for us. And the clasp their hands together and pray. Lord, thank you for the food that you will provide. And even as they said, so there were so many instances of this, even as they said amen to that prayer, there would be a knock on the door and the local butcher or the local baker would say, God woke me up at 3 a.m. this morning and told me to bake bread for the children and I brought it and they would have their breakfast. Why is George Mueller my hero? Because George dared to live brave and not play safe with his faith. Because he was willing to step out and take risks for God, believing him for the impossible. And so God went ahead and did the impossible. Because his faith was real and he wasn't playing safe. So where are you? What about you? Let me go back to the question I asked at the beginning. Are the things that you are living for worth Christ's dying for? Now, I don't know if you're here this morning and you're thinking to, myself, to yourself, I have never heard that verse. And I did not know that I'm not supposed to be living for myself but for the one who died for me. And when you look at your life, you can see your pursuits, your dreams, your desires are all about me and my own. And there is very little of Christ in those dreams. And I want to believe that even as I have spoken this morning, there are those of you who feel convicted by the Spirit of God that something needs to change. That the focus of your life is directed in the wrong direction. That even though God has blessed you, given you a good career, maybe even a comfortable life, it's been about me and myself. And I need to live for Christ in a new and radical way. And so as we come to the end of our time together in the scriptures, I want to call you to commitment. I know that God is in this place convicting and helping us see that our lives have been misdirected. There may even be those of you who are here today and you know that you've been running away from God, that God has called your life in a totally different direction, 
but you are determined to pursue your dreams and your goals irrespective of God's call. That there may be those of you here that God is saying, I want you to serve me as a youth worker, as a missionary, as a pastor, and you don't want to hear any of that. You want to run away in the direction that you want to take for yourself. That was me as a university student. I went to India to study in India. I knew what I wanted to make of my life. I'd chosen my career, my supposed career, very carefully. I wanted to create wealth. I wanted to be tremendously wealthy through my career. And I was determined to go in a certain direction. But it was in India, in my final year in university, that I came to know Christ as my Lord and Savior. And one of the first things that God told me is, I want you to serve me as a pastor. And I said, no, Lord, I don't want to do that. I've made out. I don't want to become a pastor. You know, I mean, I can understand why we need people who will preach the gospel and praise the Lord for the likes of Billy Graham, but I'm not your man. Go find somebody else. And God told me again, asked me again, I want you to become a pastor. And I said, Lord, no, I don't want to be a pastor. I've got all my life made out. I'm, 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 on, a, I'm on the right trajectory. I know what I want to do with myself. Find somebody who doesn't yet know what they want to do with their life. And God told me again, asked me again, I want you to be a pastor, will you be? And I said, God, are you slow or what? Don't you understand what I'm telling you? I don't want to be a pastor. And as I read the Bible, I was so convicted, I decided I'm not going to read the Bible anymore. It's too convicting. There are too many things that are confronting me. I don't want to read the Bible. And I decided because it was, you know, summer, I was going to go up to a little town called Shimla in India, where I was going to, you know, just enjoy my summer days. It was tremendously hot during the monsoons in Delhi. And so I went up this mountain to this little town called Shimla. And one morning I'm sitting at a cafe drinking a cup of tea when I saw an Indian man walking up and down the, the, you know, the square. And he was looking facing the sun, looking straight into the sun. And when he'd get to the end of the square, he'd start walking backwards and keep his eyes on the sun until the other end of the square. And then he would walk again. And he did this, I was told, day after day after day. And I asked the waiter who was serving me, what is he doing? Doesn't he know that he can go blind? And the, and the waiter told me rather nonchalantly, you know, oh, he's a holy man. I said, what do you mean he's a holy man? And the waiter told me he has determined to look into the sun until God reveals himself to him, even if he goes blind as a result. And as I sat there with my cup of tea, I was gripped. Here is a man who is willing to lose his eyesight so that he can know God. He's looking for God. He doesn't know where to look. But he's doing everything that he knows how to do, what to do so that he can find God. And here I am. I have come to know God. I have found the God of heaven and I'm running away. And I don't want to spend my life telling these sorts of people where to find God. I was so gripped by that that it was then that I said, Lord, I will give my, up my career. I will give up my dreams. I will go into ministry as a pastor if that's what you want of me. That was almost 35 years ago. I left, I finished my undergraduate, did not pursue my master's as I'd wanted to, went back home, joined the theological college, studied a Bachelor of Science in Divinity, and then joined the church and became the pastor of Nairobi Chapel 30 years ago. God is still in the business of calling people away from cushy jobs and lovely careers and dreams that they have to serve him. Because one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them. So I want us to come to a time of prayer. And maybe you know that God is speaking to you, that you've been living for yourself and something needs to change. And you can feel the conviction of God on your heart. I want to ask you to stand up as a sign of the fact that you're saying, yes, Lord, here I am. I will un unashamedly identify myself, see my standing up as my submission to the greater purposes of God. There may be those of you who feel that God is calling you 
to leave a career behind and to serve him in ministry in one form or another. And you can come to and say, Lord, I hear you. I want to live for you and not for myself. So let's turn to a time of prayer. And if you're here and that's a conviction of your heart, maybe you're not used to doing this, but could I ask you to stand as your sign of saying, here am I, I submit before you, God. Anyone here this morning who would say, God has spoken to me and I have heard your voice, just rise to your feet and we will pray for you in a moment. Anyone here? Thank you. Have the courage to do this. This is between you and God. And I don't know what God is saying to you and how this will play out, but you do, and God does, and that is enough. Anyone else? Anyone else? Let me give you the opportunity. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? We're going to pray in just a moment here. So let me just give you one last chance. Pastor John, I'm going to ask you to come and lead us in a word of prayer. And so as he comes up now, if you know that you're wrestling with God, and yes, God has spoken to me, and something needs to change, Say yes and stand as Pastor John leads us in a word of prayer, please. Father, we stand and others of us sit before you and we do so with humility. We turn our mind and our thoughts towards the cross. And Father, we all stand beneath that cross. And we see your son laying down his life in love for us. We say thank you. Thank you for loving us and paying the price. And Father, by your spirit and your power, move in us. That we may lay down our life for you. Father God, take away all that would keep us from commitment to you father we we all feel it all of us standing and sitting here today we feel we feel the tug of self we we, we feel the sacrifices lord we ask that you would remove them by the power of your spirit and by the conviction of your love as we stand before the cross of jesus father god for each person standing here you know and you love each one And Lord, we know, we claim the promises of your goodness upon them. And Father, we, we claim the promise of the glory of sharing in your suffering upon each one. We claim the promise of the way of the cross upon each one, Father God. And we pray upon each person standing here, life in Christ, our Saviour. Speak to them, guide them, Lord, and give us wisdom as a family, as we encourage, as we talk, as we spur one another on to love and good deeds. We ask in the name of our risen Saviour, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, John.